Shapir Chippewa here in Wisconsin. As well as a member, I'm also an Otter Clan. On behalf of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight to the Wisconsin Idea Spotlight Program, Ho Chunk Land Stories of Dejo. We are thrilled to be in person in the community with all of you this evening. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, all of you for making it the time to be a part of this program. Before we begin, uh, quick, a few quick notes. A special thanks to our program sponsor, the Sandra G. Sponham Alumni Park Signature off. Program Series Fund, and to our program partners, University of Wisconsin-Madison, our shared future, as well as team. Out of respect for our panelists and guests, please take a moment to silence it, or as well as turn off your cell phones here this <laughs> evening. Our, our moderator for our tonight's program is Molly Pauliette. Molly is a doctoral student candidate in UW's Department of Anthropology. She's also a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation Buffalo Clan and has professional experience on collaborative projects with tribal, county, state, and federal officials addressing critical social needs in the state here in the state of Wisconsin. Her research interests with cultural anthropology are in Native American anthropology, indigenous resilience, climate change, and United States American Indian policy. Molly has a, is, has a PhD minor in art and is an accomplished designer and bead worker. She holds a bachelor's degree in sociology with human services emphasis as, as psychology, uh, minor coursework in drug and alcohol counseling from Viterbo uh, College in La Crosse, Wisconsin. She also holds a master's of uh, social work degree with an emphasis in child care, child welfare from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. At, as well as at UW, Molly has completed a graduate certificate in material culture and master's degree in anthropology. The team putting together today's, uh, putting together this evening's event is also grateful to Molly for her collaborative work in helping to plan and make this program possible. Molly, may I pass the mic to you? Okay, you all are gonna have to bear with me. I'm not used to speaking into a microphone and hearing my own voice. I think we still got some phones on. <laughs> okay, well, good evening. I do wanna welcome all of you to Day Jope and the University Alumni event, Stories of Day Jope. Um, I wanted to thank David for introducing me and Captain Steve for the boat ride, if you were able to get one, hopefully it'll calm down and you might be able to get one afterwards. And Asia, Rave, and Janice Rice for being our, our tour guides on our boat. A lot of this event, when we were trying to plan it, we were really trying to reach out to as many Ho-Chunk people as possible and especially Ho-Chunk alumni. That's one of the things that we've been trying to be consistent with in our, our um, planning, our event planning is using as much Wisconsin knowledge as possible, right? Because we're all Badgers, right? Um, and also the alumni staff, Mackenzie and Stephanie, they've been keeping us all on track and organizing everything and they picked out the menu and organized the chairs and everything else. So they were really on top of their game and it's awesome that we have them for alumni staff. Um, the one thing that David did mention was that I'm also a project assistant to Our Shared Future. It's funded through the HEAL program, which is a Mellon grant that the university received. So through that program, I work part-time as a fellow and go ahead and help with these events. So I helped with the treaty day last year and then also the flag raising that we did in um, last fall in November too. So those kinds of events, and we'll have more events this next year, hopefully, because my position is funded for at least one more year. So, and then our share future will go on without me, I'm sure, because everybody's invested in it. <laughs> um, tonight, a panel of Ho-Chunk tribal members will discuss Dejo, an important community to our tribe and to daily life here in Dejo, and a place currently known as Madison, Wisconsin. The panelists will explain the complexity of the land and water and how Dear as Ho-Chunk people, 
this area is to us. Along with the 1800s shaped the social and cultural experiences of Ho-Chunk people and continue to impact us today. And also as alumni, they have experience with on this land and what it has kind of taught them in their time here. They have both encountered different scenarios that have shaped their view of how it is currently. Um, today's discussion is part of our shared future program that represents UW's Madison's commitment to respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other nations of Wisconsin. It is a first step that calls on each of us, faculty, staff, and students, and alumni to deeply consider our shared past and present with indigenous people in this place, Dejo, and to make our own personal and institutional commitments to achieve a shared future with them. Our shared future is a process, not a land acknowledgement or something to recite. It is a collective act of moving together from ignorance to awareness, an educational framework for passing questions and an opportunity to celebrate Ho-Chunk people as well as learn about the hard truths of our histories with them. It is a challenge to educate ourselves and each other and create a better future together. For more information about our shared future, there is a website that you can all access and events will be posted on there this fall. Um, it's oursharedfuture.wisc.edu. This evening, we did receive a cancellation on one of our, from one of our panelists and if you came just to hear him talk, I apologize. Our famous one, number one and only Ho-Chunk faculty member at UW-Madison, artist Tom Jones. I know. Don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I know a lot of people were excited when he was going to talk. He is doing a show in West Bend, Wisconsin for his mid-career show. So there are a lot of events um, and opportunities to learn attached to his mid-career show. So if you want to Google that, you'll be able to do that. Um, and he is doing an artist talk as part of that, that exhibit. So it is very, it's gonna be, it's gonna be amazing. That's, I helped work on it. Okay, so then um, we have his mother here, super, super huge honor, Joanne Jones. I don't know if you guys all knew that when you were reading this event. Um, she's an associate judge for the Ho-Chunk Nation Trial Court. Judge Jones has a BA in political science and social work along with a master's of social work from UW Madison. She is a 1986 graduate of the University of Wisconsin Law School. Judge Jones is serving her second elected term as Ho-Chunk Nation court judge. She has, she was also, and I think this is just phenomenal because I've been going through the establishment records for the past two weeks of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, but Judge Jones was the first female president of Ho-Chunk Nation and has been an active in national tribal state issues and matters involving tribal sovereignty. So. Thank you for coming. As Ho Chunk, this went out. No, it did. Okay. As Ho Chunk people, we're not taught to brag about ourselves, so we try to be humble. <laughs> um, Kendra Green Deer, sitting next to me, is a member of the Ho Chunk Nation and descendant of the Red Cliff and Fond du Lac bands of Lake Superior Ojibwe. She is a doctoral candidate in art history with a focus on contemporary Native American arts. Most recently, Kendra has curated and been the conservator for objects exhibits in the co-curated exhibition Intersections Indigenous Textiles of the Americas at the Ruth Davis Gallery on the UW-Madison campus and in Ho-Chunk objects displayed in permanent installations. Ms. M's cabinet at the Milwaukee Art Museum she has conducted research for the Dakota Modern, the Art of Oscar Howe exhibition catalog written and researched for the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indians, New York, and America's exhibit exhibitions, and been a consultant for numerous ex ex exhibitions. She is currently the collections managers for the Little Eagle Arts Foundation in Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin, and she earned her bachelor's of arts in museum studies from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and her master's degree in art and museum studies from Georgetown University. Extremely qualified panelists. <laughs> I 
have a small PowerPoint that I we did for this tonight. Um, we are thinking that our format is going to be about an hour. And we're hoping that at the end you feel comfortable enough with us to go ahead and to ask questions. If there's questions that we don't really feel comfortable answering publicly, we might say, let's talk afterwards. Or I don't feel comfortable answering that. So those are something that may happen. So don't feel offended if we get that response. This is from an exhibit that's actually right now at the Field Museum. And it's something that is really could be applied to every piece of land in the United States, correct? In North America, South America. Um, we kind of wanted to start out with talking about where this land started from our cultural perspective. So Joanne is going to be our first speaker. Already? Already. <laughs> <laughs> We joke around a lot, so you can well, laugh. I, <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about the map. Well, anyway, I welcome each and every one of you. And um, Molly is very outstanding. I'm proud of these ladies here going after their doctoral degrees, I guess. And um, we have some more out there that are working on, on their um, degrees also. I'm really proud of them. I always wanted to have someone be a psychologist. And I think we um, have a student like that going into that uh, area. And foremost, I wanted to have a young person be a um, historian. And uh, I said, I wanted our stories to be told by our, our people, by our tribal members. And uh, it's much different. Maybe not a lot, but it's, it was different from how, the perspective of how an Indian looks at life. And uh, so I always wanted a historian um, student. And I think we have one right here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm uh, really happy to be here. And so I greet, um, well, first of all, thank Molly and also Mackenzie Zale and Stephanie Wallace, the uh, Foundation Association, the Alumni Association and the Wisconsin Foundation. And then special greetings to all of you and to the chancellor, I guess we met, um, and all university members and the uh, different Indian members here that uh, are here. So so what I said to them was, I recognize you being here. So I wanted to give um, a little back of a little background and information. I know part of this program is is to learn more about each other, and I'm not a great wizard of Indian um, um, knowledge, but I was raised by old people. I was raised by elders, and now I'm 82 years old. And I was raised by an aunt, Bear Clan woman, and my fathers were almost 100. My father was 100 and passed away several years back. And I had an uncle who inducted me into the medicine lodge, which is the traditional um, spiritual base of the um, Ho-Chunk members. Although there's a few Oneidas in there, but uh, we, we uh, they marry into the tribe and they're part. And so um, they uh, are part of us. But on this um, information that um, I want to um, 
in part here is um, they asked him one of the times that he presented for the treaties. And uh, during that time, I um, was explaining how I went to law school and used to be trudging up Bascom Hall, Bascom Hill. And every time I started going up that hill, I grew so mad. <laughs> and um, because I knew that they were mounds and burial mounds and that uh, we had on, our, on Bascom Hill and other parts of the university. So every morning you saw this person trudging up the hill with their little backpack and, and uh, probably had a mean look on their face. So anyway, that's, um, that's how I, I um, uh, came to the law school. But how do we work then? How do we work? We're talking about the future. We're talking about a shared future, as, as uh, she stated. How are we going to make a better world for the future here, the students and the area, and I guess for the area, for the world? How do we all work together? But first of all, we have to understand each other and know more about each other, why we do things, and why we, um, why we, our knowledge is so important to our group. And so you understand that from our perspective, then there's reasons of why we do things we do. First of all, I want to let you know that I'm full-blooded, enrolled, full chunk. And I was born near Black River Falls in Jackson County. And then I found out Jackson County was named after Andrew Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> so schooling does help. <laughs> so then that made me mad again. <laughs> so, so anyway, Jackson County and Black River, there was a little Indian mission there that was started a long time ago with some German missionaries. And we had little shacks there on, when I was real young. And so, of course, I didn't know any different. I was happy, and my mother and father were um, together at that time. But my parents were traditional. That means that they adhered to the old ways, and that's how we were um, raised in the beginning. My father was inducted into the Medicine Lodge, and that's a great honor. And he was inducted at 11 years old. And so, um, so he, um, that when, when you're inducted into the Medicine Lodge, there's, there's a, um, a special way that, a uh, special spiritual way that our people uh, must observe, and it's hard. Our elders tell us it's hard to be an Indian. So it's the same with you. It must be hard to do whatever you have to do. But they always told us it's hard to be an Indian. And it's hard to pay to be an Indian. And it's hard to learn the knowledge that you have to learn of the Indian. And so that's how we were told. And, um, but however, what happened was my family broke up. And um, my four sisters and I were sent to my paternal aunt to um, live with her, probably around seven or eight years old. And she promptly sent us to Christian boarding school. So there we were. I need a Kleenex. All of a sudden, this air is making my nose run. Um, but anyway, um, the um, they sent us to this Indian boarding school. Thank you. And 
And uh, <sighs> there I was. And I remember that part of, part of me, when I was left there, I hid out in a hedge when my parents, I mean, when my aunt was going to leave. And I thought, geez, my parents left, and now my aunt's leaving me here. And I kind of hid out there, and I thought, uh, I guess I'll have to go through this myself. So uh, while I was there, you know, we got an education, which I, you know, I, um, I'm glad. And then we were boarded there. And I ran away twice, I think it was. And um, uh, my girlfriend, too. And so then I had to read the Bible about three times. And I read it front to back. And uh, I guess because I was kind of uh, stubborn and obstinate. Still am. Yeah. And, <laughs> And so that's kind of my experience. It was kind of a good and bad experience. But I like learning. And I like learn, uh, reading. And um, so I did. But there was a little bit of resistance because they could talk their language, which was German. They were German missionaries. But we couldn't talk ours. So if we talked ours, we were reprimanded, but they could talk German. So um, after that, then I attended the high school, and it was an all-white high school. Um, and um, that was back in my aunt's house. And this was in the little town of Maryland. And then after that, after graduation, I went into the military. So. Um, that's kind of what happened to me in the short, in the short. I'm trying to give a little background how my people gave their, um, give their, some of their knowledge of our um, customary ways of life. And currently we have 12 clans. I guess there used to be more, but we have 12 clans and they consist of two divisions. One's upper and one's lower. It doesn't mean one's higher than the other one. It's just that one designates the sky and one designates the ones on the earth. And um, they had distinctive roles and responsibilities. You didn't deviate from those. Even today, you don't. And um, so it's been that way for a lot of generations. We still practice the responsibilities. So what I've under, come to understand and learn is that Ho-Chunk are formidable, strong, spirited people. Even though we sometimes appear pitiful. In our many removals from Wisconsin, our answers endured hardships. And I heard the stories about my grandfather, Choka, that he was on a, in the winter and they were having a type of feast or something that was near Tremplo. I think it's called Bluffside in that area. And there was water, a uh, lake nearby, and my grandfather was skating. You know, they were having a, kind of a good time. But the soldiers came, and they had their bayonets and forced them onto forced them onto uh, trains into boxcars. And it was winter, and so that's how they were sent out west. So there were so many removals, and our Ancestors like, ancestors, like I said, endured so much. And uh, my dad and I used to talk about it. I took him to all the places that we were sent to. There was Blue Earth, I can remember. Uh, there was uh, South Dakota. We went all the way to South Dakota, Nebraska, Omaha. Um, 
in um, by Mankato Village. I took him to all those places. And I said, Jaji, I said, why did our people always come back to Wisconsin? And he said, he was always calm and he said, we have to take care of our graves. We have to take care of our land. And um, see, as members of the Bear Clan, we have a responsibility of role, and our role is security of the village, like in the old days, security of our people. But then we had to take care of the land as high as we could reach, as high as we could reach. So he was still following that. He was still following that. And that's where so many people have, why so many of our obstinate people came back. They would even beat the soldiers back. That they'd come down the rivers and walk and that type of thing. And so you see that um, Jaji and our whole kids, our elders, we're keeping our ancestors, we're keeping our ways of life. And one story that stuck to my mind on this was there was a woman, this family were, had, after they had come back, I guess they were in the kitchen, looking out over a little, little garden, <laughs> garden, and it was foggy. And I always tell the story, and, and the fog across the field a figure start coming out of the fog, and um, and here it is that woman. That woman had walked seven years, to come back to Wisconsin, and I, they told me her name, and today I still can't pick it on my head. And so there, there, um, they had the spirit, and they had this tenacity to be able to come back no matter no matter what. So anyway, um, that's the kind of background that um, I was um, I was able to um, um, grow up with. Our elders, you know, we didn't we, there was no thing as as um, you know the fast foods or nothing like this. We were out in the woods, out in the country near Crick sometimes, and that's where we live. And um, our elders, our esteemed elders, and they uh, keep the knowledge of our nations. And they keep knowledge of the songs, the stories, the responsibilities, and the laws that are handed down orally. Our way is an oral tradition. We have to remember, listen and remember. And so, like the natural laws, those are what we are supposed to adhere to. Not like thou shalt not do this. But the natural laws that we have are like you practice love. You practice compassion. Honesty, humility, respect, bravery, and the courage to live like that. That's really hard. When I said it was hard to be an Indian, it is. And so um, us who are striving to learn this stuff and remember this, it's hard. It's like them trying to pound knowledge into our skull, into our thick skull. And I just wish I had listened more when they were telling the stories and the songs. And so that's the kind of background that my people had. And around here, related to this, we have um, spiritual ways, 
as I said, the spiritual ways of our people. They talk about day job. They talk about it differently. And I was reading some old, old stories from um, one of the books, The History of Madison, how the settlers came in. And um, it was from um, 1887 and before that. And it was kind of fun to read. They were talking about the different uh, villages and that type of thing and how they were formed and who formed them and when and that they told all about that but in this we have we had villages here and um it sounds like to me i mean this is my thick skull again it seems like some of the words some of the stories of the translation of these lakes and of these uh, villages are uh, kind of contradictory, but there's stories behind them. And so um, this lake, as you call Mendota, are some of the Translations are some, what our people called it was Wakshikominuk. That means where the Indians live or where they sit. So this must have been a village here that uh, Wakshikominuk was our word for this. But I understand that Mendota in that book said it was Chippewa. But then I was talking to Janice Bodine, and she said, no, the word for um, for lake is um, something like Gitche Green or something like that. And um, she said, it's, it's uh, Lakota. What happened, she said, when they came in to start to settle and they brought in uh, people to map and that type of thing, the interpreters, they brought in Lakota uh, some of them, and so that's all they knew was they knew those those kind of words, and so some of them are Lakota, and uh, some of them are different languages. So on one of them, it talked about oh, what's the word for that? I had that down. There was a village here that was um, there was a village that. Um, was called uh, Nasak Hokachi um Hochaki Hochakira Nasak Nasak Ho Kachira and they called it Fish Lake. But what it meant was it was a grove of maple trees. Na is a wood. So that was uh, one of them. And then the other one was interesting. Uh, they called it Chihaboki. And the Chihaboki, they called it Full Lake. Chihaboke means like a teepee. It was a structure like a teepee. So if we went back into that time, probably there were other tribes or other people that were living in those kind of dwellings on, on the lake here. And they were they were uh, teepees. Because ours, ours too, now we have, we've always had wigwams and they're round um and long houses there but there may have been you know intermarrying or whatever and then there's uh there's those uh chihoboki those kind of hobokida they told me and so that's that can be but our word here for this place mendota is wangshikominuk and then um 
they called Monona. I know our people, our chief one time told me, said, Manune, that's what they called us, Manune. And I said, uh, how come? He said, well, they got lost here one time. So it's our word for lost is Manune. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's what we, um, he said, and some people called it Lost City. I read that someplace in the newspaper or Lost Village. So anyway, that's, um, uh, those are some of the small things. And then there was one called K-Chunk Ho K-Chunk Ho Kapirina. Oh no, K-Chunk Ho Ho Cha. Is Janice here? <laughs> <laughs> what was that word? I can't say it right. Ho Chunk. Hakepecha. Kechunk Hokepecha. That means that's where the turtles get up on the logs. And uh, Janice was uh, telling me that. But then the people called it Duck Lake. That was um, Wingra. Wingra. Um, in our language, wingra is wingra, and wingra means duck. So that makes sense to me that it would be, you know, a duck. But our, the, the other one holds true too, because when it gets warm, the turtles come up. And then there was a bunch of reeds, she was telling me, that uh, grew all around there. So anyway, um, am I? Oh, <laughs> I didn't mean to get carried away. Um, but anyway, um, that's uh, our people lived here. And our people had many villages here. And um, it must have been beautiful. And um, that's what they called it in that book, too, that they said it was so beautiful they changed the capital or the legislature from Belmont to here, uh, but the guy who did it <laughs> was thinking about his money, was thinking about, it was uh, founded by James Doty, Dwayne Doty, a former district judge and land speculator who held large holdings in the area. Guess where they got him from? Ho-Chunk, through the treaty. And so um, there was a lot of um, speculation. He held, um, like I said, these large holdings. In 1836, there was a year, this was the year of frenzy, frenzy land speculation on the newly treated territory of Wisconsin. And um, this area then was named for James Madison. He was the president at that time, but he died that summer. So anyway, um, this Madison has been located on the isthmus between Lake Mendota and Monona, 300 to 1300 BC or CE. And um, the uh, mound builders occupied it at that time. And they built a thousand or, or more effigy mounds. And they try to say that Ho-Chunks, you know, weren't involved in that. But we have plans. I told you that. We have clans. Some of those are animal clans that you have that are eagles, bears, otters, all those are our clans. And we have clinical clans, and those are the older ones. We have linear clan, we have linear mounds, and those with special meanings for those. And um, so um, the time of the mounds and the effigy mounds, they were here. 
And then where I'm living in Baraboo, there was thousands of mounds on the on that land where I live. That's downtown Baraboo almost. From Circus World up to almost the fairgrounds up to Highway 33. That was all mounds. And um, they were all leveled. But there is a historical marker that talks about that. So um, um, what we um, know is by the time the settlers arrived, the whole chunk could um, call the area home. And they continued to camp on it until the 1940s. And you know, sometimes some of those farmers or settlers they talked about allowing the Indians to come and hunt on the land, and they would they would come and hunt and camp there, and they said like sixty five Indians would come and they would hunt till they got whatever they wanted, and they allowed them to do that. So there must have been some people that displayed these these um, sharing and and. Uh, that type of thing. So in early in that early time, I have to laugh because there was one of these stories that um, I guess first the English came. And of course they were kind of like urbans. And they came from England. And they were trying to learn how to how to uh, farm. And uh, and so I guess this guy was showing him the land and that type of thing. And he said, would this land hold us? And the man said, no, you'll fall 20 feet into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the other one that was so funny to me was, of course, you know, our people were corn. Our uh, staff of life is corn. And so to this day, all our young people know about corn to plant it and to save it. And so it's a special corn. It's not just just a, any old yellow corn. It's, it's a corn that's been handed down generationally. And so we grow that corn. Our people grow corn. We dry it, use it for ceremonies and that type of thing. It's really good, though. Um, so um, this Englishman, was going to farm, and it's in the book. He was going to farm, and so he had he had planted about an acre when he found out that you don't plant the whole ear. <laughs> so, I mean, we could have told him that. I don't know why somebody. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, those were some of those. You should read that book, but it's from 1877. I don't know when, um, I thought I had a reference to that. But, it, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, there had this story before I close here that um, how the great, um, great, um, how I um, said great, it's the um, day joke was formed. I mean, we have stories. You got to know that we are very spirit, spirit minded people. It's, you're not just dealing with the stuff you see. You also are dealing with the dealing with the um, uh, spiritual side of life. And so that's what um, that's what um, our people are doing. And um, so um, in this story, um, the earth the earth maker, and we call him Ochapinichata. That means great spirit. But then the other one's called him Mauna, which is the earth maker. And um, he came here, and he uh, carried with him an earthen kettle. This is a story now from way back. So if he's carrying an earthen kettle, I was thinking, they must um, found they must have they found those in some of those mountains. The clay kettle. And so um, 
This area was uh, surrounded by trees that had depressions in the ground and hills and valleys, that type of thing. Uh, Maona decided to stop here and rest a while because he was really hungry. And so he filled his large uh, kettle with spring water from one of the springs here. And he put some matcha, which is deer meat, into this and some roots he had carried. He built his fireplace with supports for the kettle with roots and when it was ready, he placed the kettle on it, on the plate. When he, um, and then when he resting, he, he heard a sound in the woods. And so he left the pot to see if uh, it was his uh, hichakuro, his friend, the bear. And when he returned, his pot was on its side and the water had flown, had, had flown, uh, gone into the earth there. It uh, fashioned these, earth, these uh, lakes. And it went from the large depression, the hole to the next and connected to the next. And he could not stop it from being done. And so he sat down and he ate his cha, his deer meat, and the roots that were left at the bottom of the kettle. Mauna created the four lakes from his kettle of soup. Mauna named the lakes the next, and then those are those names that I gave you, what our name is. Wangshe Komeinak, Mungihra. And so, um, that's according to the L story, that's uh, what happened. But that's told from a spiritual side. And um, so I wanted to know that our people, even though you may not understand why we do things, this is one of the reasons, this is how we live. And so I'm, a Medicine Lodge member, and uh, my son, Tom Jones, is also a Medicine Lodge member. And um, so we want to thank you for coming and listening. And I hope I give you a little knowledge about what little I know about uh, uh, the stories of our people here in they joke. Oh, one more thing. Just one more thing. Uh, you talk about Blue Mounds. This, this book told about the Blue Mounds and how the miners started to come in here because our people were the first miners. They had, they had uh, lead. And they came like Mineral Point and uh, Blue Mound. And in our way, in our stories, Blue Mounds is a special mound. And it's got horse spirits in it. And so what is known as Blue Mound, and the settlers called it that because there was blue, you know, like the blue uh, haze that comes over our land. And they called it Blue Mound. But we call it uh, 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 Chi. So that's that's where our spirits are on that. And we have another story. All story. We have stories all over. Um, the other one is the uh, Devil's Lake. Now the Indians call it Devil's Lake. We call it Day Wonka Chunk. Would mean sacred lake, and and you see people just gather over there. But in that lake, we're told, is a spirit village. And and that's what they're feeling. That's a spirit village. And they tell a story about how one of our Ho Chunk women went to marry the chief's son of that spirit uh, spirit village. And so those are the kind of stories that we're, we're told. And uh, we're told 
not to be afraid to learn and to try to be as good as we can. And so uh, that's, that's what we do. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Joanne. Donna? Yeah, okay. Now I'm gonna be Tom Jones just for a minute, okay? <laughs> um, I, I've been doing research down in um, Chicago at the Newberry Library, and I was trying to find like a really good map that explored this area for this presentation. So you can see that I took a picture of this map, right? It's not the best picture to use, but I didn't want to pay $20 for a good copy. <laughs> <laughs> so in this picture, it's from John Hay. It says over on the left-hand margin, and it's from, um, he was alive 1769 to 1843. And he was trying to map out villages in this area. And so it's a map of Indian villages in Northern Illinois, Southern Wisconsin, and the Chicago region in 1812. Now, in looking at this map, you see over on the right-hand side, there's Lake Michigan. Do you see that? And then you see over on the left-hand side, that scribble says Mississippi. And then you have a few rivers coming out here, right? But in this map, I was trying to find Madison. Because I always kind of thought, why did they choose to make the capital where they choose to make the capital first? Like, how much knowledge did anyone really have, did the French have about this area, this region, right? And I don't really think that they had that much knowledge. They might have had a few, a couple, you know, fur traders around the area. But I don't think that there was that great amount of average knowledge in the early 1800s. That's just my own personal opinion from an educated standpoint that I've researched all these maps. Okay. Now, next we have the, the French explorers when they came to this area. So this is a more, this is kind of a little bit more because you see they have the four lakes in that area. Do you see that? Now they're completely not like where they should be. <laughs> Once again, getting to know the land, right? So when the land actually got built up, this settler area and what we're looking at, it changed dramatically, correct? So Tom really wanted to talk about settling this area and what do we have surrounding us and what the landscape used to look like and then sharing the land with our first settlers, right? And then caring for visitors. What, did that, what does that mean to Ho-Chunk people? So we had a discussion this morning when we were talking about these, um, th this presentation and what he was wanting to convey. And he really wanted to say that still today, Ho-Chunk people live and breathe and stand here and use the landscape as guides for us. So I think that a lot of us know that our highways and our byways are basically essential old Indian trails and old animal trails, right? I always tell my kids that that's why we still hit deer. <laughs> Just because we're using that area doesn't mean that they don't use that area anymore, right? So in the discussion, we started to talk about the first settlers when they came and the stories that we've heard and then Ho-Chunk stories. Now, I always knew the story that Joanne told when I was young and I decided to come to UW-Madison. One of my relatives told me this, that story that Joanne shared about the Madison area. Because they said, well, if you're gonna live there, you should know about that area. So they, he, he told me that story. And I always thought, that's why there's so much food down there. That's why it was so prosperous because they had mussels in the lakes, they had fish in the lakes, they had flooding that helped with the land staying moist and building corn and um, court, wild rice, right? So all this area was so rich in food. And then you have Maple Bluff, you know, I don't know if you guys all know this, but Indians use sugar too. 
and that's that whole region, you know, is really still there and still sacred to all of us. So that's what me and Tom were kind of talking about this morning, that we see these cues from the landscape. So in living in this area when I was younger, this is like a really brief story because we are actually at our time now and Kendra hasn't spoken. <laughs> um, but in the area and the region, it was always different areas had different purposes. So if you look at the lake and the villages that were here, I know when we've been setting this up, we're talking about the different areas and what events happened around the lake, what large meetings happened around the lake and who resided around the lake, right? So we know that in the Northern part of the lake, that's where the chief clan lived and there's Thunderbird Mounds up there, okay? And one of the areas that me and Tom were talking about, and I know we were really sticking to specifically to this lake shore, but there's so much more that, I mean, we could really spend, we could build a class basically on the, the history of the lakes, the whole chunk history. Um, so when I was a young, a young woman, one of my chokas, he lived in the area and he went ahead and Joanne is very familiar with this man. He went ahead and he took me to the spot on Lake, um, what is that? Is that Winona, right? Is it the other one? And here he said, we have to pour some tobacco now. And it was springtime. And I was like, okay, let's go. You know, <laughs> not really knowing what he's teaching me, right? And he went ahead and he told me, he said, you know, you pour tobacco and you pray over here in the springtime because all the babies are coming. So this is when the, when the um, water, when the snow left the lake. That's when springtime's coming, right? And I was like, oh, okay. So I went ahead and I went over there with him. And he said, do you see that out there? And I looked out there and I was like, yeah, it's a rock. And I just looked at him, yeah. And he said, that's a birthing stone. He said, the women would come over here and they'd have their babies. And there was a woman who had a chipotake here, a Ho-Chunk wigwam, and she would be the midwife and she would birth these children. And I was like, oh, that's cool. All right, let's go. And he was, <laughs> I was, you know, 1920. <laughs> so then here I was like, oh, okay. You know, and then, um, he, he kept on talking and there's more to the story, but he said all the travelers, when they would come to this area, if you were an Indian person, you would have your baby there and there was a person there. And there was a person there up into the 1840s, 1850s. Now you guys call that Squaw Bay. And then they used to have Squaw Lane, right? And they changed that name. And so when I started working with some officials from Madison, I was able to um, speak to a woman and her family built one of the first houses over there. It's white, it's Art Deco. And she shared with me that when they first built that house, they would still see squaws walking with papooses. I mean, it's a completely inappropriate term, right? But she would see squaws, they, they'd walk in and they'd have a full belly and then she'd see them walk out a couple days later and they had to be carrying their baby. So this was going on way into establishing Winona, you know, and Mendoza, Minota, that whole area. So it's, and I told Tom this story. I said, you know, I really can't get this story out of my head, but I feel like we should go pour some tobacco. And he said, why? And then I told him, he said, I'm gonna ask my mom. So he went and he asked his mom and his, mo her, her, his mom said, oh, huh, maybe, huh, go look. And so Tom, the explorer that he is, he went out and he looked and here I told him, I said that there was some stones that were in the area and, you know, I tried to explain it to him. I said, but I haven't been able to find that park that Ernie told me. I said, I don't know where it's at. I said, but I'll, I'm going to find it. And he said, okay, we'll find it this year. And I said, all right. So then here he went out there and he found it. And the way that he found it was that there was a marker tree there. So a marker tree, I don't know if you guys know what they are but it basically signals direction. And the Ho-Chunk people, marker trees all point to um, important place. To an important place. <laughs> so, and I, I, I 
shared this with Tom. Um, and he said, he said, I found it. And he was all surprised. And then he had to get his mom and they had to go explore. And every so as a community, we've identified that place again and we know it. But that once again was a story that I was told over 30 years ago that I said, we need to look into this now. So we still have these stories and they're with us and they're with individuals. And he really wanted to emphasize that the way that we located that place was that there was a marker tree there. So it was important and it was a way to find that location. So you'll see these marker trees throughout Wisconsin in certain areas. Um, that's all I can say on that. I could have write a book on marker trees. Okay, so the next um, Tom wanted us to share is that on that white side, that white map, there's a bunch of little dots and he sent me these maps, okay? And those dots are basically where all of the mounds were at throughout northern Wisconsin. So, and northern Wisconsin to the state of Wisconsin, okay? So I was about, okay. And then he said he wanted to share comparatively, where are we at today? And then that's what the other Ho-Chunk population is. So there's over 5,500 5, Ho-Chunks living in Wisconsin right now. So there's quite a few of us, right? And then I think we have a larger community because of our marriages and everything else, but that might not necessarily be displayed. So that's one of the things he wanted you to, to know is that this is where all of the mounds were, and then this is where we're all at today. It, not, it doesn't necessarily mirror the most important points because we do re recognize the fact that we are in a colonial society. And a lot of our major points that were used previously are now significant points to European culture, like Bascom Hill, like the Capitol. Those are, what do you do when you colonize a place? You go in and you put your monuments on top of other people's monuments because you are colonizing, you are taking control and you have to take control of the most important parts, right? So we recognize that. And then next, I got, we just kind of wanted to talk about the mounds and that's just from like the picnic point perspective, old and a beautiful picture of the scenery and what that looks like. Now I was telling Kendra and Joanne that I was like, I think in my mid twenties when I was told that Ho-Chunks didn't build the mounds. And I was surprised because I, I was raised knowing what to do around the mounds. So I said, well then how do we know how to take care of them? How do we know to walk around them? Why do we teach our kids to walk around them? We could just run over them. Why, how are we not the mound builders? <laughs> so do you see what I'm saying? Like our culture teaches us from a small person to walk around the mounds. So when we went to Devil's Lake, um, our, our parents would give us a, a cigarette and tell us to pour tobacco, like open it up, pour tobacco, and then go swimming. You know, say a little prayer and then go swimming. So they would teach us this and then to find out that people were saying, and educated people, scientists, social scientists, archeologists, anthropologists, um, would tell us that we weren't the mound builders. But now recently in the past 10 years, they say we are descendants or ancestors. Our ancestors are the mound builders, right? So if you're thinking that, you know, I thought about this, I was raised in the 70s, my parents were raised my parents were raised in the 40s and so on and we're handing down this lesson on how to care for the mounds it's really offensive to be told that we weren't part of the mounds right so i think recently it's just kind of moved to that point in acknowledging ho chunk and ho chunk kind of putting that out there that we are part of this history and don't discredit us and don't discount us in that history, right? So I think now we'll let Kendra go. <laughs> um, it is 6.08, so if you guys wanna stay a little later, we have till 6.30. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll let Kendra talk now.
Well, thank you, Molly, for, for inviting me here. Thank you, Mackenzie, and for, for the tour guides this evening. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I am here today as a Ho-Chunk woman, mother, and I'm also a current PhD student at UW-Madison and um, in the art history department. So I'm here to tell you about a little bit more about UW campus um, within Gay Choke and, um, and the Ho-Chunk. So uh, just a little bit about my background um, and expanding on what Molly has already spoken about. Um, my background is in museum studies and particularly uh, exhibition development and most importantly, like how institutions are representing indigenous people, not um, some of my experiences, not just working with Ho-Chunk history or objects, but at many indigenous cultures. So um, this, critique and reflection on how indigenous people are being re represented also includes how the wider public's pop culture representations um, impact indigenous people. So I came to UW-Madison about five years ago now, and um, I was just coming from working on an exhibition focusing on pop culture and was very, focused on the, the words, the labels, the symbols that are all around us that hint to indigenous history, but don't always um, blatantly call it out. So um, when I came here, um, I was very focused on particularly the mounds, because uh, like Molly suggests, we uh, had said, um, we grow up learning about the mounds and how to act respectfully to them. So being on UW campus, I knew that I was home after years of doing schooling on other indigenous people's territories, the Pueblo and Piscataway, and um, I was fortunate to be able to be somewhere surrounded by things that I recognize growing up. Um, so I guess just a little bit more about my research and what I'm, what I'm working on. Um, my dissertation is focusing on contemporary indigenous women artists and indigenous placemaking, uh, particularly the impact of art making and visual language and art forms it, within the museum, urban spaces, and rural spaces. So all this background in exhibitions and art, I um, am very much focused on the visual language of things, not always what needs to be written but just what can be interpreted by seeing, and that in itself is cross-cultural as well. So, as a Ho-Chunk woman and student being here and walking across the campus, I find it often impossible to rec reconcile my experiences as a student on this campus today with the histories of violence the Ho-Chunk people continue to face. So walking and seeing the mounds, um, and again, this the visual, um, visual art forms of the land um, that it's difficult to get past the history of the very first building that was built at UW Madison was. Um, uh, North Hall, which actually needed to needed to level a mound in order to be built. So from the very beginning, um, what 
my fellow panelists have already talked about is the importance of, of these um, indigenous made reminders that this was a native place prior to settler colonialism and how from the very beginning the campus had um, began to remove this history and um, and start to fill in a different view of the lake and become a part of the scenery in a different way than, than what the mounds um, were. And while the university has taken steps to reconcile the destruction and removal of the mounds to construct this campus, we see even today how the mounds are vulnerable to human intervention and the university has yet to demonstrate in clear ways a commitment to protecting these sacred sites and burials. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, but even as recently as in July of last year, uh, a student in the soil sciences department um, damaged the two-tailed spirit mound on observation, observatory hill. And um, they were they dug five gallons of soil and I think only recently this news has been public. Um, but this is really the continuance of the same colonial violence um, that we have to face in settler society and it's just being continued here today. Um, so as a student, I have seen the university take actions to practice and move towards reconciliation, including the plaque that was unveiled in the last couple of years, um, installing Ho-Chunk made, made art, um, like the white horse uh, sculpture, and also as recently as the flag raising from last fall that Molly was instrumental in doing. So, um, However, it's a Ho Chung as a woman, as a mother, can't help but want more for our Ho Chung people. So I would like for the university to teach, use this opportunity to teach about the significance of these mounds. And um, and wonder how, despite the ongoing effects of this violent history um, and violence represented by this campus, its monuments and its inadequate protection to sacred sites, how we can move towards reconciliation. So um, myself, as well as many of the individuals that made this evening happen, uh, invested in the partnerships with Ho-Chunk to establish and enforce protections of the mounds, um, including abiding by the corporate and practicing empathy a little bit more, especially when it comes to our mounds and the bits of history that are still represented in our campus. Um, also facilitating a process where the university identifies and returns excess land back to the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, and perhaps we can take this opportunity to teach a little bit more about the Ho-Chunk Nation and make our history a requirement rather than an elective. The photographs you're looking at, this is um, the first side is something that happened in 
I think it was 1930 or something. And then the other side is Charles Brown. He's up on the top. And this is basically a mound that was destroyed for Martin Luther um, King Jr. Boulevard. And it's kind of, it's kind of like interesting too. Of like, you're, you destroy indigenous culture to honor another culture, race, but it's still this destruction. And at this point, there um, an estimate is like, you know, close to 900 mounds within this area, which is it's pretty phenomenal. So you can, I think everybody can gather how important and how sacred this area is to Ho-Chunk people, and that there has always been a continued presence, presence of Ho-Chunk people within this community. Um, then this next image, I kind of put up for Joanne because after she said that in our treaty talk about walking up the hill and being really mad, I, I, I kind of see that happening when I do my own research. Or you kind of get mad, you gotta take a break because mentally, emotionally, you can't handle it nonstop. But this is them digging into a mound and destroying it on one side. And that's kind of like, would be a whole chunk perspective of campus and having that image in the back of your mind as you walk up the hill. And the other side would be what other people think of when they think of being on Bascom Hill on campus. So just to give everybody that image of what Madison represents to different people. And then it is now 620, so I believe we have 10 minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions. Oh, she wants to know the name of the book Joanne was referring to. You know, there's really some really awesome books in the archives at the State Historical Society. I used to work in the archives, like when I was in my undergrad, and I would just sit down in the vault and read. <laughs> I was is, I was getting paid, but <laughs> uh, this book is called A History of Madison, Dane County and surrounding area, published by uh, William J. Park. Company, Madison, 1870. I think that's 73. I can't read my own writing. But that's, um, uh, I don't know who gave it to me, but somebody gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of hard to read because it's like a little bitty line. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, there's a, a there's a whole language department, and they have language apprentices preservation and yeah, historic preservation, where they do all these things, and they have online classes during COVID. Um, Joanne's daughter Tori was instrumental in setting up some of that online language courses, so that you could take it anywhere in the United States. Um, they also have websites and lessons and books and manuals. We just developed a new syllabary like within the last 10 years that is now being used for writing Ho-Chunk. So a lot of the stuff, like if you guys do go to Tom Jones's show, we, we did the Ho-Chunk history in English and then we did the Ho-Chunk history in Ho-Chunk. So we're trying to incorporate it as much as possible throughout so that it gets more familiar. Um, Tori actually set up a program where infants were brought to a center, and that's their first language was Ho-Chunk. So it's something that's really ongoing in preserving it. They're teaching in high schools too, not just the Ho-Chunk Oh, Ho -Chunk and there's a college, people. yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a college course. It's like one credit for on campus for Ho-Chunk also that college students can take. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more question. No, no, no. It was it was in English, but they were German, 
and they spoke German. So they were Lutheran No, I think there was even Jell Kung Reform. Yeah. yeah. See, I know my stuff on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one more question back here. I visited the canoe last week, or two weeks ago, and it's really interesting. It, it, they're preserving it, and they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do with it and how they're gonna use it as a teaching tool. Um, the alumni is doing an article on it, so hopefully that has more news, and I don't know if we can say it, but I guess I'll just say it. There was that canoe that was found, and then there's also been two other canoes located in that area. So they're talking about the um, geography of the lake and what it actually looked like. And if the canoes that they found were actually at one point on the lake shore, and then as the lake got flooded more, it got, they got the boundaries of the lake got pushed out. And if that may be one of the reasons why they were, um, coming up now because they're actually on a ledge and then the, the canoe is like sticking out of that ledge so you guys will learn more as more comes and that the his ho-chunk historical society i mean ho-chunk heritage preservation is working with the university and the state historical society on that um and bill quackenbush would be on the lake in the next week doing a youth trip with over a whole hundred ho-chunk youth down the yahara river and he actually made a dugout canoe which is kind of neat right because they developed the canoe and he made a dugout canoe and they're gonna bring the youth down. So it'll be interesting to see next week. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you no, all no, for coming. No, we're not done yet. We're not done yet? No. Uh, we, um, we are working or I'm sitting on the board, which we haven't met yet, but I think it's your sister, isn't it? That um, we want to build a museum and we're, those artifacts would eventually, I would like to see eventually, I know you have to um, uh, keep them in a good way, but um, we're looking at starting a uh, museum. So we have a little one, but uh, we need a, we need a, a good big museum. When I was president back even 30 years ago, the, um, other tribes all over the country, we traveled everywhere. Uh, they had museums that were wonderful back then. And so um, that's what we, we need to. So thank you. Maybe we'll ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> So on behalf of the Wisconsin Alumni Association and our Share Future Work Group, thank you to each of our speakers here this evening for sharing not only their stories, expertise, histories uh, with us tonight. As a small symbol of our of the thanks, uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Association would like to present each of these speakers with a gift to express their gratitude for sharing here this with this evening, as well as thanking each of you for being here with us here this tonight. So take a moment to recognize our speakers for this evening. That's right. Oh, halfway. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for our speakers here this evening.